You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Art of Change with your host, Pamela Thompson. Pamela will provide you with the tools to navigate you through any change, personal or professional. Pamela will also be interviewing inspiring women leaders and change makers from around the globe. So now, please welcome the host of The Art of Change, Pamela Thompson. This is The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and we're broadcasting live today from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Would you like some inspiration and guidance to help your dreams come true? Are you interested in learning from a woman who has been successful in a number of non-traditional professions throughout her career? Today's show is called Breaking the Rules, Becoming Successful as a Woman in Non-Traditional Professions. I'm excited to share that Dr. Lisa Turner is my guest on today's show. Lisa recently retired as an aerospace manufacturing engineer, working on aircraft components for Boeing to become a freelance writer. From starting a bicycle shop in 1975 to 40 years working in corporate America, Lisa has spent time in mostly male-dominated professions. She has worked high-rise construction as a trim carpenter, apprenticed as a plumber, and worked as a bicycle and automotive mechanic, a power supply technician, and a quality engineer. Prior to her aerospace engineering, Lisa was a licensed home inspector and general building contractor. She wrote a book, House Keys, The Essential Homeowner's Guide, about all the mistakes she found in construction, producing a guide to help builders and owners save money and avoid surprises. There's also a section on decluttering and tips and tricks for maintenance. Before that, Lisa was the chief training officer for Tyco Fire and Security Services, a $10 billion public corporation in Boca Rattan, Florida. Lisa holds degrees in engineering, a BA in English, an MBA, and a doctorate of science. Her third and latest book, Dream Take Flight, describes how she built her first aircraft at the age of 45 and flew it from South Florida to Maine and back. Released in June of this year, it hit the Amazon bestseller list in July. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Pam. I'm honored to be here with you and our listeners. Well, I'm excited to have you here and to learn more and more about your exciting career. Not exactly your traditional career trajectory. <laughs> Not so at let's all. Do- <laughs> Let's dive right in. I'm, I'm curious, Lisa, is there somebody early in your life who made you believe you could live your dreams and succeed, succeed in whatever you wanted to try? Yeah, you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners would say uh, parents. It was my mom. My dad left the family when I was six, and my brother and sister were older, and they were off at college. So at nine years old, I started having this recurring dream about flying, just putting my arms out and lifting off from the backyard and flying through the neighborhood and coming back down and landing. And I told my mother about it. And instead of saying I was crazy, she said, that's okay. And then I told her I wanted to be a rocket pilot. And I said, hey, at school, there's this boy named Neil, and he said, women can't be rocket pilots because they have to get rescued. And my mother is looking at me, and she's laughing and smiling, and she said, you can do anything you want. Neil is wrong, but you've got to concentrate in school. Well, little did my mother know that I was actually skipping school. 
I'd go right out to the schoolyard edge, and I was so shy and afraid, I'd turn around and go back home and go into the closet and read magazines. Well, one day, the truancy officer came to the house, and it was pretty scary. And when she left, my mom pulled me aside and said, please do something for me. I want you to go to school and concentrate on your studies. She also told me that the next day she was going into the hospital for a test and that I should get off the school bus at my aunt's house. When I was walking up the street that next morning to the school bus, I looked back and there was my mom framed in the doorway and I waved to her and she waved back. And that was the last time that I saw her. I was devastated. I took her last words to heart, and it set the stage for the rest of my life and career. Wow, that's quite a, <clears throat> a heart-wrenching story, Lisa. And it just, well, first of all, my heart goes out to you that you lost your mom at such a young age and that it happened so quickly that you didn't get a chance to say goodbye. So, ugh. And the other piece is the power that key people in our lives, I usually it's one or both of our parents or a significant person in our life who cares about us <clears throat> early on can make such a positive difference. If your mom had said, well, he's right. Neil's right. Oh, of course you're, you're a girl. You can't do that. Your, your whole life would have been totally different, but because she said what she did and she had such a belief in you, it, it really, I guess, drove you to do all the amazing things you've done in your life. So that, I think that just bears witness to the fact that all of us, whoever we are, if we have younger people in our lives, whether they're our own children or others, how important it is to t totally believe in them and speak our truths because I, I didn't have such a dramatic thing happen to me when I was young, Lisa, but I totally believe in what you said. And I understand it because my dad, I was the eldest of three girls and I was eight and a half and 10 years younger than my sisters. So my dad really treated me like a boy. And so he believed that I could do anything that a boy could do. And from a young age, he enabled me, you know, I would do stuff in the house and I'd mow the lawn, I'd shovel the stove. So no, I do all the tasks that a a lot of the boys did on the streets because, you know, that's what you did. And I really highly value my dad only passed a couple of years ago, rest his soul. But he just really, too, implanted in me the belief that I could do anything that I wanted as well. So I think this is this is huge. And, and I love that you've included that in your book because it it is so, I think, inspirational for people. So before that's we great. go further... Yeah. I, before we go further, I'd just like to share that I invite people to stay to the end, if you can, today, because Lisa is going to be offering a few free gifts at the end, just just so you know. Now, Lisa, at, at the in the intro, I shared with people a, a few things that you've done in your multifaceted life. So tell us a little bit about your career path slash entrepreneurial journey. And, you know, as you're doing that, maybe you can recall several key change points or key decision points along the way. Absolutely. I had a career just full of twists and turns. You know, some people seem to know what they're going to do and others uh, never do. And, and I would argue that it's okay to, to not know right away. In the 60s, when I was growing up, there was an expectation that you would know what you were going to do when you were in high school. And all I really want to do is take things apart and put them back together again. And I got a crush on my English teacher and decided that's what I would do. I would teach English. I would be like Larry. When I, so Jim? when I graduated college, my teaching certificate, I actually opened up a bike shop. <laughs> That, that's, a, that's part of an amazing story that you're going to share with us, Lisa. And we're about to cut to a commercial break. And when we come back, Lisa's going to share a little bit more about her career path, the lessons she learned and the challenges she faced. 
This is Pam Thompson, The Art of Change, broadcasting from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Stay tuned. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately 3.5 to 4 million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations in classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Sheikh Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and with me today is Lisa Turner. She's had an incredibly varied and interesting career path, and and has even built and launched her own aircraft. So before the break, we were talking, just starting to talk about Lisa's career path. And she told us about how she had been influenced by a high school teacher and ended up doing an undergrad degree in English and then promptly decided to start a bicycle shop instead of pursuing a career as an English teacher. So Lisa, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and any key challenges you faced and lessons learned at that particular change point in your life? Sure. It's uh, What I learned was it's okay to not know what you want. I At the time, I thought, oh, I've got to be so organized, and I've got this teaching certificate. But the discomfort of feeling lost drives exploration, and that can really lead to answers. Yeah, that's, those are really wise words. And I think so often, I, I recall my son in particular, I have two kids, my son, when he was in his last year of high school, he was like just agonizing over what he was going to study at university. And it's like, part of the agonization was feeling that once he'd made the decision, that was it. He had to lock into something. And I said to him, look at all the things I've already done in my life. You know, it's, it's like it's the first step. And I think the more we can get that message out, it's so powerful to like release that fear around, oh, my God, you know, I got to do this for the rest of my life, even if I don't like it. That's that's a really that's a big one. That's a that's a great lesson. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about another key change point and a bit more about your journey? Sure. Mid-career at age 45. I had a really intense job managing training for a major corporation. I'd been taking flight lessons on the weekends. I really wanted to get my pilot's license, and I thought, you know, this this is tough. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but I really, really wanted to do it. So against the judgment of my family and my friends, they all thought I was crazy, I decided to get my pilot's license, and then I decided to build an airplane in my garage. And I worked on it on the weekends, and it was all I could think about. I was just passionate about it. And I ended up loving it, and it was great. So based on that experience, which is so different from when you go back to your, you know, studying to be an English teacher and then having a bike shop and then doing training, corporate training. So what was the key 
cha- I guess challenge you faced at that point. You kind of shared a, shared a couple of challenges and the key lessons learned at that point. Yeah, I I learned it's okay to go against the grain and be your own person. You'll really surprise yourself that you can do so much. Those of you on the uh, listening end, if you've gone to night school and worked during the day, you know what I'm talking about. It really builds a lot of character. And while you're going through it, say, how can I do this? But then afterwards, you, it's amazing what you can actually do, what you're capable of. There was uh, another situation when I was 58. I thought I'd retired, right? <laughs> My <laughs> husband and I had moved to the mountains of North Carolina. Then the markets crashed, and we lost our savings. So I had to go back to school for some kind of job. I said, I've got to either go back and do what I was doing or do something different. And I really wanted to be a home inspector. Now, this job, this is where you crawl underneath homes and shoo away snakes and giant spiders. <laughs> and you crawl around in the attic and you get on the roof and all these things. It's a very difficult job. Less than 2% of women are home inspectors. And I just, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. And I did it for years and it was just super so i found out from that that it's never too late to learn something new or do something totally different i love that and and that's such a powerful message because in our society for so long people sort of have this artificial this number in their head for some people, it's 55, some it's 60, some it's 65. Well, we're going to retire then, and we're going to go traveling or, I don't know, sit in a rocking chair or whatever. And you <laughs> chose at 58 to become a home inspector. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I, I just love it. How did I, – I'm curious because you've, you've made so many changes in your life. How did you know that you had to make a change? Do you, did you, do you get a sensation in your body, or how did you know, like, it was time to move forward and do something different? I would just get a passion to do something different. And it was its just so opposite. You know, my husband, he knew what he wanted to do when he was six years old. He wanted to restore airplanes. And I never, I never got that. I'm, I'm still exploring things. I, I'm totally with you on that. But what I've noticed about my life is I, I'll be doing something. And I just realized, like, It doesn't juice me anymore. Like I got off the road. I was doing a number of keynote speeches and selling my book about a year ago. And I came back, I came off the road and I just felt like really quite tired. And I thought, you know what? This isn't juicing me right now at this point in my life. So I just made a decision to just take some time off. And I waited for a while and took a while for something to percolate up. And then, uh, you know, then I made a change in my business in terms of what I'm doing. So I find, you know, a lot of times you know, just listening to our bodies, because you, you talk about your, your passion, it's something similar. Yeah, I just know that uh, when I'm not juiced by something, okay, it's time to move on. And it's curious, whenever and you in your book, you speak a bit about this is that a lot of times, if you're open, and you sort of get really clear that you're not really juiced or happy with about what you're doing, then this new opportunity, or person will come into your life, and offer you something and you'll say, Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll do that. And so, yeah, I, I'm always fascinated by how, how people who do many things in their lives, like yourselves, do it. Because there's a number of people who are scared to make change. They, they really are. So good on you to just bite the bullet, bullet and do it. Did you, did yeah, you want to share? I think, Pam, that you're right about the, the body. You need to pay attention to it because I found that some, some of my careers – I would feel tired, and I, it's, it's, that's exactly what you're describing, and, and I felt that, and I felt like that I needed to be doing something else. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you, you concur there, because I think, you know, our, if we learn to listen to our bodies, they always tell us the truth. Like, we can go into our brains and rationalize stuff, but at the end of the day, our bodies always know the truth. 
So, Lisa, we're about to cut to a commercial break now. And when we come back, Lisa will be sharing with us some challenges she's faced as a woman in male do- in the number of male-dominated fields she's work- worked in. So stay tuned to The Art of Change. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at jobsannex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. Jobsannex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm Pamela Thompson, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Lisa Turner. She's had a fascinating life doing everything from having her own bicycle repair shop to being a home inspector to being an aerospace manufacturing engineer. So before the break, she was sharing with us a number of key change points in her life and some key lessons, some of them being it's okay to go against the grain and do do what you believe is right. And it's also okay if you study something and it's not working for you and to switch gears and say, this isn't working for me. So some great lessons. So now, Lisa, what because you've worked in so many male-dominated fields, I'd like I'd like to ask you what key cha- challenges have you you faced as a woman working in these fields? Yeah, uh, it, that's interesting. I think it's just my opinion. I think a female has to prove herself in a male-dominated field, and it's not just being as good or better. You know, we just hear, oh, you know, you have to be better. Well, you don't have to be better, but you need to maintain a delicate dance, I call it. It's a balance where, this is going to sound wild, where you don't really show up a guy. In other words, <laughs> kind of let the, let the men um, do their thing and be attentive, helpful. And the most important thing, I think, is being direct with, and that's really true, being direct with everybody but especially with men. They really appreciate that. Let me tell you a little story. After college, before starting the bike shop, I went to work as a trim carpenter on high-rise construction. When I first started the job, the guys put me through hazing. It was incredible. I had a stack of doors. There were 10 full-size doors, and they said, you've got to carry these up 10 flights of stairs. You know, there was plenty of equipment to raise things up to the top, but they weren't showing me those. So I went ahead and I took all the doors up the 10 flights of stairs, and then I was accepted. <laughs> oh, was, my goodness. There was, wasn't any more hazing. And then uh, another quick story. Back in high school, it was the 1960s, girls took home economics, and boys got to take shop. And I said to myself, why can't I take shop, you know, the rule breaker that I am? 
what am I going to do? How do I get in the shop? So I went down to the guidance office, and I walk in, and this guy is sitting at a desk, and I said, well, I'm Lisa Turner, and I really want to take shop class, and I'm being told by the teachers that I can't. And he looked at me like I was from another planet. He rocked back and forth in his chair, and he chewed on his pencil, and he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do with you, a girl that wants to take shop? I'm going to have to ask the principal. Well, he asked the principal, and the principal said yes. So I got into shop. That that's in both both two awesome sh- stories. So this idea when you work with men, really be yourself, but balance between not showing the men up, being direct, and being helpful and attentive. I think yeah, I think that guys don't like women to play games, and I mean some women do play a lot of games. So I exactly. <laughs> I understand your, but that's amazing <laughs> in terms of your hazing that you you walked up. 10 floors with all these doors on your back. Good on you. You're obviously strong as well as mighty here, Lisa. So what, what would you say, like part of your stories did share some lessons, but what key lessons would you say you've learned along the way working in these male dominated fields? You've got to be your own advocate because no one else is going to do that for you. And you need to discover your own core values and develop life goals based on them. This is why, Pam, your work is so important because you spend a lot of time on values and goals. They're critical elements to happiness. Well, thank you. Yes, I believe that too. And and I know in your book you share near the end a lot more about that. But, yeah, like values are so critical because, yeah, it's like do you, do you want to speak a little bit more about the values piece right now? Well, I put that, I did put, put that in the book because I felt yeah. you, without figuring out what your values are, you're not going to be able to set your goals. But to, to find your values is not very easy. You really need to go through exercises, which I, in the book I take the reader through exercises in thinking about what their values are. It's not simple. I mean, you really have to spend some time and think about it, but that's the key to goals. And, you know, Brian Tracy, the the main guy on goal setting, he said that 3% of people have their goals and have them written down. It's 3% of the population. So you, you can see if you could, if you just set your goals and you don't even write them down, you're, you know, you're a little bit ahead. So to, you got to get a start on it. Yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying about values. And in fact, with my coaching and my consulting clients, well, you know, you do values for organizations as part of strategic planning. But the idea of developing values, it's not something we learn at school, right? So but values, what, what I know to be true as well about values are these principles that underpin what we do, but also how we see the world. So it's like, if you, you know, if you have a value and it's different from someone else's, a lot of times when you're in their presence, you feel uncomfortable, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. you, you know, I don't know whether you, I'm sure you've experienced this. You can be someone, you can meet somebody or you're in a managerial position and you're interviewing someone and they look awesome on paper. And yet there's something niggling. There's something that doesn't feel right. They, they're respectful. They're, they seem honest, all these sort of things. And then later on, when you hire them, you find out if you're in a collaborative culture, they're really competitive. So then you learn, oh, my goodness, that's a value that they have. And it's not bad or it's not good. But if you're working in a corporate culture that values collaboration, and you're full on, you know, about competition and competing with everybody and individualism, you're not going to fit in really well. Right. So, yeah, this exactly. stuff is huge. This stuff is huge related to values and goal setting as well, getting really clear about what you want. Any other key lessons you've learned away along the way working in, in so many male dominated fields? Um, my understanding is we, we need to cut to commercial break. So hold that thought, Lisa. After the break, Lisa will be responding to the question about some more key lessons learned along the way 
It's Pam Thompson, host of The Art of Change, broadcasting from BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay tuned. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration, plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm Pamela Thompson, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Lisa Turner. And we're talking about breaking the rules, becoming successful as a woman in non-traditional professions. And Lisa certainly has done and and had a career tra- trajectory that speaks to that. So before the break, we were talking a little bit about some key challenges she's faced as a woman in male-dominated fields and some key lessons learned around along the way and one of the key lessons she talked about is be your own advocate and the other was discover your own core values and also set goals related to them because your values really underpin you know how you can be successful really at anything and and really help you move forward in your life so lisa what advice would you give a woman interested in working in a non-traditional career and, and also being successful in such a career? I'd make sure that you really love it. I'd learn everything that you can about the field. I'd be direct with all coworkers. I'd persevere. If you've figured out your values, what you care about and set goals, then you can do anything. I think that Passion will shine through and open doors for you if you can do that. So make sure you really love what you do. Learn everything you can about the field. Be direct. Persevere. Clarify your values and set goals. And by doing all those things, your passion will throw throw through. Great, great advice. That's it. Okay, great. So... Recently, you wrote and launched your book, Dream Take Flight. And by the way, I really enjoyed your book. I just, I really felt, Lisa, like you hooked me in or or right from the beginning. And I really wanted to, I really felt like I was on your journey with you. So, yeah. So share a little bit about your book. You're welcome. Share a little bit about what prompted you to write your book. As you can figure out with from some of the stories that I'm telling. I was very shy as a child. I had a lot of trouble talking to people and I seemed to be afraid of everything and I was trying to please everyone. When I went ahead and built the airplane in the garage and that was big rule breaking. You know, the my family, my friends, they all said, You are crazy to do this. And I was kind of proud of it. (laughs) 
this is really this is really cool. Well, when I finished the airplane and I did the test flight, I, it's just indescribable how I felt. It was just so fantastic. When I flew it on my cross country to visit my family, when I finally got them to accept that I was going to fly the airplane to see them, it was absolutely life-changing. I had an epiphany at 10,000 feet. It was the culmination of a journey from being shy and reticent to one of getting confidence. And in that moment, I knew I had to write about it so that other people might get the same level of inspiration that I did. Whoa. Well, I'm at my heart is just so open. And I am I, I was really inspired by reading your book, Lisa, and I know our listeners and anybody who picks it up will will feel the same. I, I love the description of when you were flying. And I mean, it was very real when you described the challenges that you were fa- you faced as flying. And I'm like, talk about gutsy and you hung in there so that that you really put yourself to the test. So that's really exciting. And Thanks. Who, who did you, would you say you wrote the book for and what impact do you hope it will have? The book is meant to be an adventure that's fun and entertaining. So in that sense, it's really for everybody. But it's also meant to inspire readers who haven't thought through their values and goals. And then here we are again talking values and goals. It's really important. Prompting them to think about it. And that's why, in a very unconventional way, I put that section in the end on setting goals. It's also directed at people who love to fly or want to learn how to fly. Readers say, oh, it would make a great book for high school reading or young adults. And, in fact, I contacted the local high school, and I'm going to give them a book, um, a, a box full of books because the kids want to read it. So the the best part really about writing is the thought that someone will get a laugh, an insight, or a call to action from reading it. Books, I just, I love books. I can't read enough of them. They can improve someone's mood. They can create happiness. They can provide inspiration. And the thought, for those of you out there who would want to write Here's a good reason. It's the thought of giving that gift to your readers is just so exciting. And that is one of the things that drove me. So true. And and having written a a best-selling book as well, it's it's and you really feel from the beginning that you want to make a positive difference. And that's certainly a driver. And I just want to say, too, this idea of young people, that is awesome. And I think there's so much that's needed now in high schools with so much gloom and doom in the world and so much violence, Lisa. So and your and your book is truly inspirational. And for kids to realize that they can, you know, make make things happen. And I think I actually was asked the last couple of years to give a workshop uh, to to at risk youth, young women age 15 to 24. And it just curiously was called making it real, turning your dreams into reality, right? Because I I think we need to learn to dream more. And we need to certainly influence our young people to dream, dream big as well, dream more and dream big. So I agree. I I agree so much, Pam. That's so true. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you've shared really quite a bit about your book, but is there something else that you learned from writing your book? Well, it it was an incredibly large project. And I know, you know, the airplane was a large project, but this the book took on a life of its own. It was almost bigger than, if you can imagine, than building the airplane. <laughs> and it was really daunting. And it, And one of the issues that I had was, it was I was so emotionally charged, I had trouble sitting down and writing. And so, you know, I had to get some help from, from my husband, you know, to send him a chapter and he'd get me charged up. But it was it was really it was difficult. I learned it was tough to write. You know, and and I think you've touched on a really good point, the fact that we need support 
to create our dreams, make them come true, and when we're writing as well. So we're about to move to the commercial break, and I'd like to open up the line. So if people want to phone in, feel free to do that to 1-866-451-1451, 1-866-451-1451. Pam Thompson, Art of Change. Stay tuned. French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ouvmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoub.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. The opiate epidemic has reached crisis levels, and with so many families affected by addiction, opiate-related drug overdoses, and death, the time is now to have a real constructive conversation about addiction that could lead to better prevention, treatment, and recovery. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, presents The Alan Charles Show. Alan brings a message of hope, sharing his unbelievable story of surviving a 24-year addiction to cocaine and highlights from his memoir, Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. His raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. Join Alan each week as he brings his listeners to a true understanding of the grip of addiction. It is only with this understanding that we can begin to heal. The Alan Charles Show, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm your host, Pamela Thompson, and with me today is Dr. Lisa Turner. And uh, Lisa has had a really interested and varied career path um, working in many male-dominated professions. And before the break, we were speaking a bit about her recent book, Dream Take Flight, which made uh, bestseller on Amazon in July. And we were just finishing up the piece on what she learned from writing her book. So Lisa, do you want to share a little bit more about what you learned from writing your book? And Oh, before we go there, if people would like to call in and have a question, the number to call in is one 855 1451 one 1451 So Lisa, what else did you learn from writing your book? Well, for listeners, who are writing or want to write, if you chunk it down into small pieces, at least this is what I learned, it became the companion piece, sort of, to building the airplane, building the book. Don't give up. Break it into manageable pieces and get help when you need it because it is a big, it's a big project, but it's very rewarding. It took... 20 years for this book to get out. When I first thought about putting it together, it was it was it was tough. I kept putting it aside and it went I went I'd go for years without working on it. So those of you who are writing, just persevere, don't worry about it. Great advice. Interesting that that's great that you shared, Lisa, that it took you that long to write. I, on the other hand, almost burnt out. So I took some time off and within about five months, the seven keys to creative living in my book percolated up for me. And then I started to write and I ended up writing my book within within a year, actually. So I think, you know, it's really variable in terms of your situation. But obviously, if you're trying to write a book when you're working full time, it's a lot more difficult than if you've carved out space, or if space happens to come up in your life for other reasons. It just, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Anything else you'd like to share about lessons from writing your book? Uh, I just, I would, would really say to people, uh, write down your stories and try to get try to get that story out for other people because we love everybody loves a story and it's so important and 
Don't ever think that your story isn't going to be valuable to somebody else. Yes, because stories really connect us, and they and they share they share our vulnerabilities, and they also help us realize that we're not alone. So, yeah, thanks for that. So, we were talking a bit before, Lisa, about core values. Are would you be willing to share your top four val- core f- five core values with us? Sure. You know, it, that's one thing people have a lot of confusion around when I say, well, before you can set your goals, you need to think about your values. And they're like, well, uh, what, what is that? And so maybe if I go through uh, some of mine, you'll understand better what I'm talking about. One of mine is responsible. I just call it being responsible. Taking responsibility for who I am, where I am, and what I do. This has really taken the sting out of troubling moments in my career where I wanted to blame something else, but I realized it would be a lot simpler just to take responsibility and get on with it. So that whole area creates so much baggage for people. It's really useful. Direct, I like no like no games playing or drama in relationships, and, and this is one thing that's really served me well in male-dominated fields, it's really, in my opinion, a requirement in business. I mean, you want your coworkers and your your boss and your subordinates to be direct with you. Trustworthy is another one. You can be counted on. When coworkers recognize this, work is so much easier. It's, It's almost like oiling the machine. Mindfulness. This is living life in awareness and appreciation. When you develop mindfulness, and I know that Pam talks about this in in her books and in her classes, you will find that appreciation for the moment goes up exponentially, and you're going to regret less and feel less stressed. And finally, legacy. Leaving good things behind. Create and give things to others. Writing a book is an example, but you can contribute in so many different ways. It's wonderful to think that someone else will enjoy and benefit from what you've done, both before and after you've gone. So true. Uh, no, thank you very much for sharing those, but because they, they really, I think, in, have in, will enlighten people who are listening. And I think we all frame them in different ways. And one of mine, I'll just I'll just share two of mine to contribute to the discussion. One of mine is contribution, and it's something like your legacy piece is wanting to make a positive difference in the way in the world, whatever that looks like, right? If I'm just working to work, doesn't juice me. I got I've got to feel that I'm I'm making some sort of difference. And love of learning, which is clearly high on your agenda, too, based on the number of things you've done in your life. If I'm not learning, I think I'm dead. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah. And, and these are these are really important pieces. And, and I love that you've actually added that section in your book because the rest of it is really all stories and it hooks you in. And to be honest, I didn't want to put the book down, but I obviously had to go to sleep. I was actually visiting my kids and grandkids, and I, well, on the plane flying there, on the plane flying back, I finished it, and then I would stay up late at night reading the different chapters. Wow. But, you know, and, and then, you know, that piece at the end, it's, like, quite different from the rest of the book. However, it's really helpful to, to ground the book and the lessons you learned and to then support people to, to take action, which, you know, which Thanks, is Pam. really important. You're welcome. You're welcome. So... How would you say that these core values you've shared a little bit have influenced your professional journey, this responsible, direct, trustworthy, mindfulness legacy? It's really clarified what I want in life, and it's so important. The world is so complex right now. You know, it's interesting that Henry David Thoreau wrote his book on Walden Pond, in what was it, 1845, and he thought life was complicated. Can you imagine him now with, you know, the phone is going off and the email is beeping and, you know, the television is blaring and all this stuff is going on. I mean, we've got to clarify. We've got to drop the baggage and and focus more. 
So true. And with those words, thoughtful words, we're going to move to the commercial break. We're moving into the home stretch. Stay tuned. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Le Colde des Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com, www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Welcome back to The Art of Change. I'm Pamela Thompson, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Lisa Turner. And we've been talking about breaking the rules and being successful as a woman in non-traditional professions. Now, we're in the home stretch, Lisa. So what would you say is something you're really excited about in your business right now? I'm working on an add-on to the values, creation, and goal-setting section in Dream Take Flight that we were just talking about. I'm working on a small book. I think I'm going to call it Your Simplest Life, Ten Tricks to More Time and Peace of Mind. It has advice for de-stressing and creating more opportunity to get what you want in life. I'm also thinking about building another airplane. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So at the at the top of the show, we talked about the fact that you're going to offer uh, several gifts to some listeners. Do you, would you like to share a little bit about what they are and how people can access them? Absolutely. Um, if you go to my website, dreamtakeflight.com, again, that's dreamtakeflight.com, you'll find all kinds of things, but one will be an area where you can get this uh, audio book, free audio book. Uh, it is, this audio book is by, narrated by Mandy Michaels. She's Canadian, and she's got an incredible voice. And I don't know about you, but I just love audio books. You just start it in the car and have it go. So you can find that on the website, but if you want to make it this process even easier, is just email me at lisaturnerbooks at outlook.com, lisaturnerbooks at outlook.com, or you can go to the website. And what I'll do is I'll send you a coupon. You'll need Audible, and I need to know whether you want the Canadian version or the uh, U.S., and that, that'll drive um, how you download it from Audible. Well, that's very gracious of you, Lisa, to offer that to all the folks who are listening today. That's that's really. So do you want to put a time frame on this? It's like people who follow up with you in the next 24 hours or what would you like to do? Oh, the next week is fine. The next week? Okay. I can probably take the first 10. Okay. The first 10. Okay. That's very, very generous of you. Thanks for that. Now, um, anything Anything else you'd like to share? 
you doing? You're yeah, pretty. I, uh, I well, I expect that we have a lot of overachievers on the call today because that you know this is the kind of stuff that they listen to, which is just as wonderful. Here's just a little bit of advice. Don't be too hard on yourselves. You know, you're all probably type A's. Uh, when things aren't going your way, just remember you have choice in every single moment to decide how you're going to view something. Discover your passions and let them drive you. So don't be too hard on yourself. You always have a, a cho choice and discover your passions and live them. Yep. Great advice. Great advice. Now, just to add to that, this business about being an overachiever, I, I think it's really interesting to sort of reflect on your life and your stories as well, Lisa, because from an early age, your mom helped you become a high achiever, if you will, right? And you were really mm -hmm. driven to achieve based on that. Likewise, I was. And, and what I find is many of the women that I've coached and work with, that's been the case as well. So, yeah, brilliant advice from, from Lisa on this. So as we, we tie up the show today, I just like to thank you so much, Lisa, for being on the show today and share your wisdom and your, your gutsiness. I really appreciate uh, your wisdom. An honor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to share that my guest on next week's show, October 30th, same time, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 Eastern, is Shelley Wallace. Shelley founded Hagensburg Chocolates and since 2007 has produced and sold specialty chocolates throughout North America and beyond. The title of the show is How to Change an Existing Business into a Social Enterprise. Hope you're able to join us. Till then, remember to embrace the art of change and make a positive difference in the world. You've been listening to The Art of Change with host Pamela Thompson. Tune in each week as Pamela shares her experiences based on leading, coaching, and consulting across five continents. Learn firsthand about change, leadership, entrepreneurship, and women in business on Pamela Thompson's The Art of Change. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.